My guest today is Steve Smith. Steve, how are you? I'm great, David. How are you doing? I'm doing really well. Uh, did you know that you were the first person that I recorded an interview with for this show? Oh, wow. No, I don't know if I realized that. Was yes, that at this, Code Mash? Or it where, was at Code was Mash yeah. about 15 years ago. And um, I recorded two episodes that day, and you ended up as episode number two, but you were the first one that I recorded. We talked about some caching technology that nice. no longer exists. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a record for the longest time between yeah. a guest appearing on my show. <laughs> All right. All right. A record that may never be broken. So who who was episode one? You'll have to find them then. That'll break the record. <laughs> I'll come back to them. <laughs> uh and um, well, well, today, what, are we, what should we talk about today? Uh, well, I've been talking a lot about clean architecture lately, and uh, it's a popular topic. It's, uh, if you, in fact, last month at uh, .NET Conf, uh, they posted all the topics to YouTube, um, and it actually had more views than the keynote or, or any other session at uh, .NET oh, Conf wow. on YouTube. So uh, apparently people want to know about this, uh, this topic. So one of them, one of them was mine. I actually watched this uh, video. I'll put a link to it in the show notes. Clean architecture with ASP.NET Core 8, I think is the full title. Mm -hmm. um, what, let's start with a definition. What is clean architecture? What do you mean when you say that? So clean architecture is the, the latest name for something that's been around for a while. And you may, you know, listener, be familiar with it as uh, ports and adapters or hexagonal or perhaps onion architecture. Uh, and all these things have been around for, honestly, a couple of decades at this point. And clean architecture... Uh, was coined by uh, Robert Martin, uh, and then you later wrote a book about it. But uh, the the basic idea of it is that it's a domain centric architecture, meaning that your business logic is going to be the center of all the all the logic and, and dependencies in your system, uh, rather than the database or external infrastructure. Okay, uh, that resonates with me because I I started that programming in a language called FoxPro which everything mm -hmm. was database centric. And I kept that model in my mind for years, even when I transitioned to other languages. And so this was, when I first started learning about this, it was a, it was a change of mindset for me. Yeah, I didn't do FoxPro, but it was the same for me in SQL Server. You know, right. 20 years ago, everything was, hey, we need to build this app. Well, all right, well, let's start with the entity relationship diagram and let's figure out yeah. what the tables look like and where the foreign keys go. Uh, and, and that's kind of the opposite of how you would start if you were, just building something with the objects first, with the you know object-oriented programming and, and the you know concepts of the the programming structure first, and, right. and then the how you store that right could be in a relational database, but it could be in a you know document database or some other data store. Yeah. Um, well, so what are the advantages of why should we worry about focusing on our business logic first? Well, a lot of uh, the problems that you run into. Not in the first six months of your project, typically, but you know, 24, 36 months down the road, is that your system tends to evolve to to be a certain size. Uh, maybe you moved really quickly in the early days, and you know, you might have taken advantage of uh, copy paste programming as a as a quick way of of reuse and and being productive. But eventually, that comes back to haunt you if you're if you're not careful, and if you're not putting in any sort of abstractions or or logical layers in your code that make it easy to uh, swap things out in a modular fashion or introduce seams for testing, uh, then your code oftentimes will end up being really tightly coupled to its infrastructure. Uh, and so I work with a lot of clients through my company, Nimble Pros, to try and address this through training and, and assistance with refactoring and, and migrations and whatnot. Um, but it's super common. Uh, it's, it's really a sign of success, right? That you, you, your company lived long enough, your application lived long enough to get to this point. Um, <laughs> But a lot of developers that, that never learned how to build things in a domain-centric way uh, are, are just building them in, in these tightly coupled fashions because they don't necessarily know that there's another way uh, or just out of expediency. Uh, and so the idea with these, these architectural approaches, clean architecture, ports and adapters, is we're going to invert the dependency so that we don't depend on how we talk to the you know, database or the mail server or whatever it might be. Uh, we're going to depend on abstractions or interfaces, and those are going to say what we want to do. So what I want to do is fetch a record from storage, or I want to send an email. Uh, how I send the email or how I fetch something from storage is, is an implementation detail that I am decoupled from, that I don't care about and, and I don't know about. 
Okay. So uh, there's a couple of reasons why you might do that, I think. Uh, one, if you wanted to swap your database structure, maybe giving you the flexibility to say, oh, you know, I was using SQL Server. Now I want to use MySQL, something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but I, I don't remember ever doing that, though. Yeah, it's a common pushback that folks will say, well, there's no reason why we should ever, you know, put an abstraction in front of the database because we're never going to change our database in production. Um, and that's that's a super common refrain you'll hear, uh, but it, it doesn't tell the whole story, right? Because these days, you don't typically just have your developer machine and production. Uh, oftentimes, you've, you've got some DevOps stuff in place. You've got some environments in place in the cloud where, you know, there's a pipeline and you deploy and you, you check in. Uh, and then, you know, instead of you deploying from Visual Studio, you know, there's, there's a deployment pipeline in GitHub Actions or Azure DevOps. Uh, and maybe it goes to a dev environment. And then it goes from there. If all the tests pass, you have tests, right? Uh, if that happens, then it moves to a test environment or staging environment. And it does some additional, you know, testing or whatever. Maybe some, you know, actual QA people can access it from there. And only after it passes through all those gates does it go to production. At least this is how many enterprises are, are trying to man maintain quality in, in what they push out to production. And when you have those different environments, having a flexible modular structure and being able to swap in and out which database you use or which mail server or which implementation of any infrastructure, even the file system, right, can make sense in each one of those different places. Okay. And then uh, if you're doing testing, unit testing, um, there's an advantage to it there as well. Can you speak to that? Oh, certainly. So yeah, if you if you're abstracting out your dependencies, uh, let, let's say you have a, a, an e commerce site and, and you have a checkout method. And when the customer checks out, there's a bunch of stuff you have to do, right? You got to save their order, you got to process their card, you got to send them an email. And if you put all that stuff in the one method, and all of it is tightly coupled, right, where it actually literally goes and talks to the database in that method, and it literally goes and sends an SMTP mail in that method, right, good luck unit testing the logic inside that method, because you have to have all that infrastructure in place to do it, you can only integration test it. Uh, and even that's going to be pretty brittle. Whereas if you have some abstractions for those things, if you're depending on interfaces that say what needs to happen and don't have to deal with the how, uh, then it's much easier for you to write a unit test. And you can say, well, if you know the payment processor returns true, I didn't actually talk to a payment processor, I just mocked that out or have a fake one, then I will send this email and I don't actually send the email, but I can say like, I see a note that I called that method to send a success email. Else I'm gonna send uh, your payment failed email. And again, I can see that I didn't really send the email, but I went into that code path that would have sent the appropriate email. And it becomes testable at a unit testing level instead of at the integration or, or full system test level. Excellent. Well, so you're using this uh, uh, clean architecture in, in your day-to-day -day work. You're, you and the folks at the Nimble Pros are implementing that, right? That's right. Yeah, it, it became so common for me to set this up that I created a, a template, a solution template. Uh, so it's on it's on GitHub. It's in NuGet. You can grab it. It's free. Uh, but it, it just sets up everything with the proper structure, and it has a few examples of of different patterns of of how you would do things. So you know, it's not really a full sample application. It's meant to just be a template, um, but it does have a little bit of code in it to kind of show you where things go and and how you would set things up yourself and give you some some examples that you can copy paste from to to use for your solution that you're building. Okay, we'll talk a little bit about the implementation about how how the uh, a project is set up in order to take advantage of clean architecture. Sure. So, I mean, you can do it in just a single project. It just requires a lot of diligence that you would make sure that the things that are in this folder don't ever depend on the things in that folder. Um, but one of the beautiful things about Visual Studio Solutions and the, the .NET project system is that it forbids you from doing a circular reference, sure. right? And so if you want to enforce a rule, like my domain model will never depend on my infrastructure code, like my database and my email and stuff, right? Then all you have to do is create a project structure where that infrastructure project depends on that domain model, which is in what I call the core project because it's the center of the solution. Um, and so once you put that in place, the compiler won't let you uh, depend on those things. Now you can get around it with reflection, right? But it'll be pretty obvious in a code review that you're trying to do something funky when, when that happens. Um, but it's it's no different than using a strongly typed language like C Sharp that gives you you know this extra security and safety check at compile time. We're going to use the compiler to kind of enforce this rule that we want to follow that says our business logic shouldn't depend on low level implementation details like which data store I'm using or how I'm sending an email. Um, and by putting 
the, the core project at the center and having the infrastructure project contain all those details and depend on the core project, then we're able to enforce that, that fundamental rule of dependency. And then the, the third project is just your UI, right? And in the typical case for me, it's going to be an ASP.NET Core application, um, but it could be anything, right? It could be a WPF app, it could be Java, it could be you know something else. Um, doesn't matter. It's just whatever the front end of the app is. Right. So everything, uh, it, I'm I'm drawing a picture in my mind here. I've got the por core project kind of at the center, or maybe at the top or bottom, but everything is pointing towards that. That's what, right. What goes into that core project? So in that's going to be all your business objects. And if you're following domain-driven design, uh, you'll probably have things in there like entities, which are classes that have an ID or an identity. Uh, there'll be value objects, which are you know objects that have a, a collection of properties that you uh, compare based on their state, but they don't have an identity. Like a date time would be a good example of a value object. You might have aggregates, which are sort of clusters of uh, entities, usually master detail pairs, like an order with all of its order items. And maybe there's some rules that the aggregate enforces on its children. Uh, and so that'd be another pattern that you might include. Uh, it's really just a, a special case of entities. Uh, you might have some domain services, maybe domain events, which are another pattern from DDD that I'm, I'm really a big fan of. Um, and specifications, which are another nice pattern. Um, if you have a lot of link scattered all over your application doing you know, random data access in every different part, uh, if you want to clean that up and make it so all your data access logic is in your business logic, um, specifications are a pattern that you should really check out. Hmm. Now you mentioned uh, domain-driven design a couple of times. Can you define that quickly? Sure. Domain-driven design or DDD uh, is a way of building software that really focuses on the problem domain. That's what the, the word domain means there is, you know, the problem space, the, the business domain, um, and, and doing that by modeling it in your code, in your software, right? So you create this domain model, which is just made up of classes, right? It's these entities and value objects and whatnot that sort of model the real world system. And it relies on a lot of communication with domain experts, with you know the business people that um, you're working with to, to sort of automate their system. Um, and it's really well aligned with clean architecture because it's, it's all about model-driven design. It's all about creating this domain model that stands apart from the technical solution and the how you're gonna implement it on, on this hardware from that vendor, right? It's just code that is encapsulating all the business rules and you can test it and, and you know, change it very freely as your understanding grows of the system um, without being tightly coupled to the, the technology underneath it. Okay. I noticed in your .NET Conf talk, you brought up something called CQRS, Command Query Responsibility Segregation. Can, how does that fit into this uh, clean architecture? Sure. So CQRS is sort of a another principle of, of software architecture that, that you can apply if you want, uh, and it brings with it some benefits. Uh, if you want to use CQRS with clean architecture, you typically would, would add some other layer in which you would define certain commands or queries. And so a command is, is anything that is mutating the system, is changing the system. So if you're, you know, just building a simple, uh, CRUD database type application. Create, read, you know, update, delete. Exactly. Uh, then, then your create, your update, and your delete would be commands because those are changing the state of the system, whereas your reads would be queries. Um, and ideally, you want those to follow separate pathways in your system because they have different ways that you would optimize them or think about them. Uh, and so, you know, maybe you have different data stores even where all your commands come in and they mutate uh, a certain transactional database. And then there are events or, or some other, you know, pub sub way that that information goes over to a different store that is used strictly for querying. Uh, and maybe that's where you run your reports, but, but you know, also where, you know, users can, can read the data. Uh, and, and with that architecture, you could do something like, well, I'm going to put a message bus or a message queue in front of the command data store, uh, and an, I'm going to put a cache in front of the query data store, and that might let me get much more scalability, for example. Excellent. Um, well, so the, the clean architecture sounds awesome. Maybe I should use that for every project. Is that is that a fair statement, or are there times when it's yeah? Not I mean, obviously, it's a silver bullet. You can't go wrong if you just use clean architecture all I the way down. Sprinkle a little clean architecture yeah. on it; everything will be perfect. No, there, there's definitely trade-offs. Um, it is a little more complicated than if you just built everything in one project. 
Uh, there's there's going to be more abstraction. Uh, it's really closely aligned with DDD, which is focused on a lot of uh, design patterns. Uh, if, if you're a fan of solid principles, clean architecture kind of flows from those as well. Um, if you want something that's a little simpler, if you want to be able to see everything in one place, you want to have like one method where you can kind of follow and see what what all the things are that are going on, um, then then clean architecture is maybe not the right choice because it's, mm. it is going to be a little more complicated. Uh, and, and so if you have something that's smaller, something that has less business complexity, um, clean architecture might be overkill. But uh, for a lot of, of larger systems, or if you have a system where, you know, you're, or you're moving away from a system where the, all that dependency stuff I talked about kind of, you know, feels like it applies to you. And, and you do have really long, you know, thousand line long methods that make 20 different database calls and all throughout them, right? Like that kind of thing is, is something that if you move it toward clean architecture, it's going to be much more difficult for you to create such a, a dependent beast of a, of a method. Uh, and, and you'll be able to have much more testable code usually as a result. Yeah, so I, I think the message is that if the compl if if the advantages of reducing the code complexity outweigh the disadvantage of the complexity of clean architecture itself, that's 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 the balance you have to strike. Right. Yeah. Ask yourself what's the bang and what's the buck. Yep. First law of uh, software architecture: everything is a trade-off. Yeah. Is there anything we haven't covered that you feel is critical to this topic? Um. No, I think I think we've we've touched on it. Yeah, we've we've got the high points. Well, I'll um, send it right here then. All right. Thanks so much for your time, Steve. It's, all right. I'll see you in another 15 years. <laughs> Sounds great. Hopefully we'll both be around then. All my friends know that I love technology.